Welcome to the ninth annual Sexual and Reproductive Health Webinar. My name is Craig Tower. I'm the Senior Program Manager of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center Local Performance Site here at Johns Hopkins. The topic of this year's presentation is Extragenital Infections, Seek and Ye Shall Find. Before we be begin the presentations, I'd like to invite our online participants to visit our website and view our um, available online and face-to-face -face trainings. Um, in addition to finding the archived webinars in the series, you can find more information about our trainings and the professional development support we provide to health departments in Maryland, DC, and Delaware. For those watching online, additionally, we invite you to email questions for the presenters at any time to this email, maphtc at jhu.edu. Let me turn the microphone over now to Elizabeth Lebo, the Policy and Program Associate with the Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health. Elizabeth is going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. On behalf of the STDI HIV Prevention Training Center here at Johns Hopkins and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center, our two training partners and collaborators in this annual webinar series, I'd like to thank um, the speaker, Dr. Susan Tuddenham, today, and um, all of you out there and in the audience today. Thank you so much. Dr. Susan Tuddenham is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her areas of clinical expertise include infectious diseases and in particular, sexually transmitted infections and HIV care. Dr. Tuddenham's current research focuses on the human microbiome, including the gut microbiome and HIV, as well as the vaginal microbiome and its impact on susceptibility to trans sexually transmitted infections. Her research interests also include the epidemiology of sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, and improving the detection and treatment of STIs. Dr. Tuddenham earned her undergraduate degree from Yale University, her Master of Science degree in International Relations from the London School of Economics, her medical degree from the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and her Master of Public Health degree uh, from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health here in Baltimore. She completed her internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Tuddenham. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, again, uh, the title of the talk today is Extragenital Infections, Seek and Ye Shall Find. And uh, hopefully the reason for that will become clear by the end of this talk. Um, so I don't have any disclosures, but thank you very much uh, to Khalil Ghanem and Anram Paulo for many of these slides and for feedback. And uh, our objectives today are really to describe the epidemiology and risk factors associated with pharyngeal and rectal extragenital STIs with a focus on gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, we'll also make a mention of LGV, uh, but we want to discuss the recommendations for screening and diagnosis of these infections, and then summarize the management of these extragenital infections. So just first a slide to step back for a moment. Um, today, uh, of course, we're going to focus on gonorrhea and chlamydia with a mention of LGV. But just to remind you that the universe of extragenital STIs is a bit uh, larger than just gonorrhea and chlamydia. And so, of course, um, uh, syphilis, uh, for example, can in, uh, infect the oral pharynx. These are actually mucus patches on the tongue in secondary syphilis. Uh, syphilis can also cause a proctitis. HSV, um, uh, or uh, the virus that causes herpes, uh, can affect the oral area as well as the rectum. And HPV, or human papilloma virus, which causes visible warts, um, as well as head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, and anal cancer, certainly can infect both sites. And then, uh, not to forget uh, that there are uh, enteric pathogens like Campylobacter, uh, Shigella, some parasites like Entamoeba, Giardia, and viruses like hepatitis A, which can be transmitted from oral to anal or oral to genital contact after rectal intercourse. So again, just to say that the, again, the universe of extragenital STIs is a bit larger, but today with limited time, we're gonna focus on gonorrhea and chlamydia. <clears throat> 
So, uh, so first, just sort of a 101 slide, gon uh, Neisseria gonorrhea. It's the second most commonly reported communicable disease in the US. And it causes a urethritis in men and a urethritis and cervicitis in women. Now, in men uh, at the urethral site, men usually are symptomatic. Women, however, are commonly asymptomatic or have nonspecific symptoms. And unfortunately, as we all know, in women, untreated gonorrhea can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, chronic pelvic pain, infertility, all these really, really bad uh, outcomes that we want to avoid. Um, it can cause, so, and of course, this is a purulent discharge uh, from the penis, and this is a purulent discharge uh, from the cervix. So it can also cause an eye infection or conjunctivitis. And then uh, really what we're focused on today, it can cause a rectal infection or proctitis. But remember, uh, it's most commonly asymptomatic. So most commonly these, these rectal infections are asymptomatic. And then it can cause a pharyngeal infection. But again, this is generally self-limited and very mild, if any, symptoms. Um, so very important point up front that most of these infections at the extragenital sites are asymptomatic. Then you can get disseminated gonococcal infection, but that's much more rare. So chlamydia, again, sort of a 101 slide. Uh, Cerevars D through K um, cause the regular uh, urogenital chlamydia that I think we're all familiar uh, with thinking about. Um, it's the most commonly reported communicable disease in the US. And uh, chlamydia is actually most commonly asymptomatic uh, at any site. Uh, but in men, uh, it can cause a urethritis. Uh, in uh, women and men, it can cause a urethritis and cervicitis. And again, the feared sequelae of chlamydia is that uh, when untreated, women can develop uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, chronic pelvic pain, et cetera. And then it can uh, infect the rectal site and can cause a proctitis. But again, it's usually asymptomatic. And the pharynx can be colonized with chlamydia, um, but uh, again, patients are asymptomatic. Um, so central point there. Um, it can cause also an eye infection. Uh, there can be mother to child transmission in which you can get a pneumonia in the infant. And then there's some autoimmune uh, phenomenon that can happen uh, after, after chlamydial infection. So, Let's talk a little bit about our first objective, uh, going over the epidemiology of these infections. So just uh, first the sort of um, uh, overview of these trends in the United States. And uh, the basic point is that these uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia infections are not going away. And in fact, the rates are going up. Um, so you can see uh, pretty tr clear trends here. This is US chlamydia over time. And um, uh, this is women, uh, sorry, this is men here, women in the total. And there was about a 5% increase from 2015 to 2016. Um, there was an increase in women and then a pretty significant increase in men as well. Now, some of this, I think, is that we are getting a little bit better at doing extra genital screening. So some of this may be just that we're detecting more disease, not that there's an overall increase. But I think you get the sense that f for sure these infections are not going away. Uh, the, the rates of chlamydia, as with gonorrhea, are really highest in young patients, particularly those under 25. Um, and you can see that, I think, pretty clearly from this bar graph here. Gonorrhea also is increasing and has actually increased over the last couple of years in the US. And uh, we saw almost a 20% increase, so an 18.5% increase from 2015 to 2016. Pretty significant, and there were significant increases both in women and in men. And here again, I think some of this could be uh, just that we're detecting a little bit more gonorrhea, but I think there are um, signs that there may be a real increase in disease too. And that's, uh, you know, I think highly concerning. Um, again, you see that the rates are highest in young patients, um, particularly those uh, under the age of 25. And I know uh, some of our audience here today, uh, I'm speaking from Maryland, and I know some of our audience may be in Maryland too, so I thought I would provide a little local information. Uh, but you can see here, now this is flipped from the other one, the, the red is women and the blue is men. Uh, but you can see that um, in terms of age distribution and these infections, this is chlamydia, we see something very similar in Maryland uh, to the rest of the country, that the rates are really highest um, in young women under 25. Uh, similarly with gonorrhea, again, uh, we see the highest rates in uh, men and women under 25 here in Maryland. And uh, this is just for a little bit of interest. Uh, so this is sort of a map uh, of uh, the chlamydia cases per 100,000, uh, uh, an estimate here. Uh, but just to give you some context, the national, the national rate in 2016 was about 497 per 100,000. Um, 
And the dark red here uh, is where we actually have uh, more than 800 cases per 100,000, so almost double the national average. And you can see that uh, Baltimore City um, is dark red here, so uh, there's quite a lot of chlamydia in Baltimore City. Uh, but then there's some other areas that have high rates uh, too. And here's the same uh, graph for the same figure, but for gonorrhea. And uh, just again, for context, the national rate in 2016 was about 145 per 100,000. Um, and the dark red here is uh, areas where there are about 500 cases per 100,000, so quite a bit more than the national average. You can see, again, Baltimore is a little special here. Um, a lot of gonorrhea. And then actually, if you look at this slightly uh, lighter orange here, that's where cases are 200 to 500 per 100,000, still higher than the national average for sure. And you can see some other areas here, for example, Prince George's County, that have those higher rates. Um, so you can take a look at this, uh, see where you live or work, and chances are there may be uh, some gonorrhea or chlamydia near you. So, um, all right, so incidence rates here, uh, this is just another graph, uh, basically to show you that we have also seen increases, actually particularly from 2015 to 2016 in Maryland, um, in chlamydia, and then we've actually seen some pretty uh, significant increases in gonorrhea too, um, such as in Baltimore City. So uh, we're seeing these same trends in Maryland uh, as well. So uh, just uh, before we continue with the rest of the presentation, I think it's always nice to have a case to provide some context. Um, so this is a case of a 45-year-old HIV-positive gentleman who's coming to see you in clinic. Um, he's on ART. He's very compliant, so he's been well suppressed um, for the, actually the last 10 years. Um, he does not have any symptoms, no symptoms, uh, but he just wants to get checked for everything. He's interested in STI testing. He is hepatitis B vaccinated, but he's actually worried about syphilis uh, because he's had three episodes before, including a bout with neurosyphilis. He does have some risk factors, um, so he occasionally uses crack cocaine. It's quite a bit of alcohol used on the weekends, um, and he does does endorse having multiple anonymous partners over the last few months. So he's a, he's a man who has sex with men, and he has had multiple partners over the last uh, few months with very intermittent condom use. Um, he does practice insertive and receptive oral and anal sex. And uh, he's never had gonorrhea or chlamydia, and he feels pretty good about that because he's actually had three previous urine NAT tests, which were negative for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So he's worried about the syphilis, not as worried about the gonorrhea and chlamydia. But on closer questioning, uh, you realize that he's had no prior extragenital screening. So, um, so my question here was, which uh, STI screening test should be ordered? Um, but I think for the sake of time, I will just uh, tell you what was ordered and what was po positive. So, uh, so he had hepatitis C screening, which was negative. His syphilis serologies reflect uh, old treated infection, no sign of a reinfection at this time. But look at this. So his uh, urine, gonorrhea, and chlamydia is again negative. But now that you've expanded uh, testing and you're testing him at the oral and the rectal site, he actually has a positive chlamydia at the oral site and a positive gonorrhea at the rectal site. Um, so interesting there. And again, remember, he had no symptoms. So, uh, so why do testing at uh, these extragenital sites? And I provided you with one example of a patient, but I want to give you a little more evidence to convince you that it may be important. So number one is that uh, we know that the prevalence of extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia in men who have sex with men in particular is high. So there's a high burden of infection uh, in this population at these sites. And so this was actually a study that was done um, in uh, San Francisco way back in 2003, but uh, things haven't changed too much. They looked at over 5,000 men who have sex with men coming into an ST STD clinic and then um, almost 900 men coming into a gay men's health center. And they did NAT testing as per reported site of exposure and found basically that there was a prevalence um, at the rectal site of about uh, almost six to uh, almost nine percent for chlamydia and about three to uh, over seven percent for gonorrhea. So pretty significant there. And then at the pharyngeal site, they saw about 1.3 uh, to 1.7 percent were positive for chlamydia, and then 7.8 to 9.4 percent, so almost ranging up into 10 percent, were positive for gonorrhea. 
So uh, the point here is that there's a high burden of infection uh, for gonorrhea and chlamydia at these rectal and oral sites. And I think uh, this is one other figure I really like uh, from this paper um, because, again, it emphasizes uh, that the majority of these infections are asymptomatic. So at the throat, these infections will be asymptomatic. But at the rectum, you can see about 86% of chlamydial infections and 84% of gonococcal infections were asymptomatic. Um, you also sort of get the sense, now numbers are a bit smaller in terms of how many patients were screened at the rectal site, but you sort of get the sense that there's actually maybe even more chlamydia and gonorrhea at the rectal site in MSM, um, and maybe more at least uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea than there is urethral gonorrhea. Um, so I think that's sort of an important point that people don't always realize. Um, this is, uh, so that was data from 2003. Things haven't changed much, but just in case uh, you needed more updated data, um, this is a little study uh, done in Lima, Peru um, by a group at UCLA uh, and found a high prevalence of extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia in MSM and transgender women. And you can see actually the rates of both for pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia are pretty high rectal as well. And then this pink uh, figure here is actually just from a review paper where they uh, uh, compiled data from multiple studies and sort of gave a range of what people found uh, for these prevalences. Another point I, I, I'd like to make, and I really like this slide, is that if you just test at the urogenital site, so if you just test the urine in men, for example, you're going to miss a lot of these infections. Um, because in MSM, at least, um, these, uh, you often have an isolated infection. So uh, this is a slide um, from a study in which they looked at over 20,000 men who have sex with men attending STD clinics in the US. And uh, they're showing um, what percent of these positive tests are associated with a negative uh, test at the urethral site. Basically, that you would have missed uh, that infection if you had only tested the urine in these men who have sex with men. And I think it's impressive. Um, so if you look at the positive pharyngeal gonococcal tests, about almost 74% had a concomitant negative urethral test. That's this light gray here. And uh, positive rectal gonorrhea tests, about 72%. Um, and then uh, for rectal chlamydia, really, really uh, high um, negative concomitant urethral test. So you would have missed a lot of infection if you weren't testing at the urethra. Uh, sorry, if you, were, if you weren't testing uh, at these other sites and you only tested the urethra. So what about in women? So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a high burden of infection in MSM and uh, that if you only test uh, the urine, you're going to miss these infections at the pharyngeal and the rectal site. But what about in women? And I think the first thing to remind you is that of course women are having oral sex, um, but more women than you might realize may be having anal sex as well. And uh, so there was one sort of large uh, survey study in the US that reported that actually 36% of women when you ask them, had reported ever in their lifetime having receptive anal intercourse. And then in a cohort, in a smaller study, in a cohort who were at high risk for HIV infection, about 30% of these women actually reported uh, receptive anal intercourse in the last year. Um, and another point to that was that study found that women were actually less likely to report condom use with anal sex than men. Um, so, you know, I think you can see that there are potentially risk factors here that um, you won't know about unless you ask. Uh, but if you ask, you may, you may uh, uh, find that some women have these risk factors. And there are multiple studies now, but this is one that we did in the STD clinics here in Baltimore. Um, and uh, basically, we looked at over 10,000 patients coming into the STD clinics and uh, looked at those who reported extragenital exposures and were tested for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And for women, we actually found that about 30% of gonococcal infections and about almost 14% of chlamydial infections would have been missed if you did urogenital only screening. So, you know, at least in high prevalence populations, like a population of women coming into the STD clinics, you may miss uh, extra genital uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia if you're only testing uh, the vaginal site as well. What about, um, and, and I guess one other point um, though, uh, so what about rectal infections in women? Well, I showed you back here that there's a, you know, for these rectal infections in men who have sex with men, a high number of them are isolated infections, as in you won't have a positive uh, urethral test at the same time. Now, in women, 
Uh, there are some isolated rectal infections too, uh, but it is a lower percentage. Um, so uh, about, so this is one study, there are multiple studies, but in this study, about 14% of women with rectal chlamydia and 14% of women with rectal gonorrhea had a negative urogenital test. Um, so about 14% of those infections would have been missed, uh, but it isn't as high, it's true, as, uh, as these rates in MSM. So uh, what about men who have sex with women? Well, we just really have relatively little data because I think most people aren't asking. Um, and, uh, and you know, I think there's a bit of confounding because when people do report uh, rates of rectal infection, for example, oftentimes um, there was a reason that uh, the clinician sent that test, uh, but they just may not have documented uh, that the patient was reporting having, uh, having anal sex. Um, however, uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, there's not a lot of data, but um, some, in some studies, actually, uh, the prevalence can range up to 15% uh, for gonorrhea and 22% for chlamydia. But there's a wide range and not a lot of data. However, we certainly know that men who have sex with women are having oral sex, um, and uh, so there is a, a potential for transmission there. So I guess on to uh, screening. Uh, so what are the screening guidelines? And now I'll take it back to uh, our title, which was Seek and Ye Shall Find. So again, the vast majority of these extragenital infections are asymptomatic, um, so you have to ask about them. But if you're asking uh, about sites of exposure and testing, I think you're gonna find these infections. So uh, the, uh, the CDC guidelines uh, for screening for sexually active men who have sex with men, including those who are HIV positive, say that uh, all of these men should be screened at least annually for gonorrhea and chlamydia at the sites of exposure, including the urethra and also the rectum and pharynx. Um, remember, pharyngeal uh, chlamydia screening is not routinely recommended, but uh, practically speaking, these tests often come bundled. And if you find it, you're going to treat it because as I'll show you in a minute, there is evidence that that uh, chlamydia can be transmitted to others. Um, so uh, men uh, who have sex with men at increased risk should be screened actually every three to six months. So more frequent screening for men uh, who have sex with men who are having risky sexual behaviors. Um, what about extra general screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia for uh, men who have sex with women and uh, women? Well, uh, to begin with, remember the CDC recommendations for urogenital screening, not the extragenital, but urogenital screening recommend that all sexually active women under 25 really be screened annually. And then sexually active women uh, uh, 25 and over should be screened if they're at increased risk. And I have the risk factors uh, written down up here. Chlamydia screening should be considered in men who have sex with women in high prevalence settings. Um, and that goes uh, to some extent for, for gonorrhea, gonorrhea screening as well. Now, there are no official recommendations uh, for extragenital screening, but I hope I've shown you from uh, the slides previous that evidence suggests that you may miss significant pharyngeal gonorrhea, at least, uh, and potentially chlamydia in high prevalence settings, um, and that some proportion of rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia will be missed in women with urogenital-only testing, although somewhat less than an MSM, but still you're gonna miss some infections if you're not asking and testing. There's little data on rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia in MSW, and there isn't a lot of cost-effectiveness data. But again, I hope uh, you've seen from the previous slides that I think if you're not asking, at least in high prevalence settings, uh, you may be missing some infections. So uh, I think a lot of people uh, have a very busy clinic day. It's difficult for them uh, to uh, make the time uh, to do this testing. But keep in mind uh, that patients can actually collect their own swabs. Um, so uh, certainly uh, there's evidence that women can, can collect their own vaginal swabs, right? But actually the same goes for rectal swabs. Um, so patients can collect their own rectal swabs. And sometimes patients are actually happier to do that than have you collect it. And it can save you time. You can just step out for a moment uh, the patient can collect it. And these uh, self-collected swabs perform very, very well. So um, one more point. So I've, I've shown you that I think there's a high prevalence of infection, um, particularly in men who have sex with men, and that uh, you may miss some extragenital infections in women too. But let's sort of step back for one more minute and say, look, these infections in these patients are mostly asymptomatic. Uh, 
So why do we actually care? Why do we care to test and treat? And I think the answer to that, well, there's several answers. So the first is that um, there is the potential, even though the patient is not necessarily exp experiencing symptoms for transmission to others. And uh, certainly uh, gonorrhea can be transmitted from the rectal site. Um, and so can chlamydia. But uh, there's also evidence that gonorrhea and chlamydia um, can be transmitted through oral sex. Uh, so this is, uh, there are multiple studies, but this is a study done, uh, again, out of San Francisco, um, published in 2011. And these were actually uh, men who have sex with women uh, whom they asked uh, about their sexual practices. And you can see um, that at the urethral site, about 3.5% uh, had chlamydia and about 3% gonorrhea in those who only reported receiving oral sex. Okay, so I think that's evidence uh, that there is possibility for transmission there, and a reason why it's important to find and treat uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia in the oral pharynx, um, as well as finding those rectal infections. So transmission is one. Secondly, remember, there's an increased risk of HIV acquisition associated with infection. Um, and uh, this is uh, particularly well worked out for rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, where in MSM there have been multiple studies, uh, but you can see here um, that uh, having a rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia infection is associated with a significantly increased risk of being diagnosed with HIV in a relatively short uh, time period thereafter. So I think that's a very important reason uh, why we want to be screening and treating people. And lastly, I'll go into this a little bit more in a few minutes, uh, but uh, we are very concerned about the development of drug resistance in gonorrhea. And the throat is actually a perfect storm of a place where uh, gonor gonorrhea loves to develop resistance. So we'll talk about that in a moment, but another important point. So uh, speaking of treatment, let's uh, go back to Alan and then we'll talk about treatment of these infections. Um, so uh, what should Alan be treated with? Well, he has a positive chlamydia test at the throat, a positive uh, gonococcal test at the rectum. And so he should get ceftriaxone, um, IM plus azithromycin, and uh, that will treat his gonorrhea and his chlamydia as well. Now remember, I made this point earlier, but while screening for pharyngeal chlamydia is not technically recommended in the treatment guidelines, uh, again, most of these tests come bundled, and if you find chlamydia at the throat, you're gonna treat it because of this uh, potential for transmission via oral sex. So um, very quickly now, we're gonna talk about treatment of these infections. Um, and I think you know, if you've been paying any attention, that uh, for uh, gonorrhea, drug resistance is a huge problem. Um, gonorrhea, uh, there are more and more signs of developing drug resistance, and this is uh, something that everyone in the world is actually very, very concerned about. We're actually concerned about a future where we may have completely uh, drug-resistant gonorrhea to the point where we really don't have effective medications. Uh, it's a very scary potential scenario. So uh, the story of gonorrhea is the story of a bug that is very, very good at acquiring resistance to all of the medications that we throw at it. So back in the day, uh, you can see here, back in the day, we actually could treat gonorrhea with good old penicillin. Those days are long gone. And, um, and uh, recently, uh, we have started to see from 2006 to 2011, we saw increasing MICs to cefixime and oral cephalosporin. And so by 2012, uh, cefixime was no longer recommended as first-line treatment. And uh, more recently, uh, we've actually recommended the use of two drugs to treat gonorrhea. Um, previously, you could give uh, IM ceftriaxone plus either doxycycline or azithromycin. But um, again, more recently, we've started to see that gonorrhea with elevated MICs to cefixime, that cephalosporin, also sh are likely to be resistant to tetracyclines. Doxycycline is a tetracycline, but susceptible to azithromycin. Um, so that really forms the basis for the newest update in 2015, where doxycycline was actually taken down to an alternative treatment. And the single recommended treatment for gonorrhea is ceftriaxone 250 milligrams IM plus azithromycin one gram orally. Um, so you can see sort of the evolution of resistance here. Now, why give two drugs to treat gonorrhea? Um, so one reason is that if the gonorrhea is resistant to one drug, hopefully it will not be resistant to the other. 
Um, but I think something else that's talked about it a lot is that uh, the goal is to try to prevent the emergence of resistance. And I think people make the analogy to other uh, infections where uh, we do do this, uh, things like TB and HIV. But I think there are reasons to think that uh, our approach here, unfortunately, may not be completely successful in uh, preventing the emergence of resistance. And that's for a few reasons. So the first one is uh, really to do uh, with gonorrhea uh, or is relevant uh, to gonorrhea in the throat. So I mentioned that gonorrhea in the throat is a big concern for us in terms of development of drug resistance, right? And um, in the throat, uh, number one, there are actually a lot of other Neisseria species. So Neisseria gonorrhea causes gonorrhea. But there are a bunch of other Neisseria species that are colonizing uh, the throat and the oral pharynx, and they're just sort of living there happily. But they may have drug resistance elements, and gonorrhea is very social. It loves to acquire those drug resistance elements from those other Neisseria species. Um, so because those species colonize the throat, this is a place where gonorrhea easily acquires resistance. Of course, gonorrhea is very smart in acquiring resistance. It can mutate its own DNA. It has multiple mechanisms, uh, but that is one. And at the same time in the throat, uh, there's poor penetration of many of our antibiotics. So you can see it's sort of uh, a very difficult situation where we have poor penetration of antibiotics and an environment where uh, drug, drug resistance elements are easily acquired. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we're very concerned about pharyngeal gonorrhea, um, detecting it and treating it. Um, secondly, uh, I think, uh, remember that the vast majority of these infections, particularly these extragenital infections, are asymptomatic. But then think about, so many people never even know they have them, right? But then think about how many people are getting a Z-pack, azithromycin, for their upper respiratory tract infection or their sinusitis. And I think you can see uh, that we're probably doing monotherapy more often than we realize. Um, so again, the recommendation is two drugs to hopefully prevent the emergence of resistance, uh, but there are reasons, uh, I think, to worry about that. And uh, the story continues to evolve uh, because uh, there was a, a little outbreak uh, that was reported in 2016 in Hawaii, a cluster of gonococcal infections with decreased ceftriaxone on susceptibility and high level resistance to azithromycin, very concerning. And you may have seen um, in the news recently, um, in the last few weeks, uh, there's a patient in the UK who acquired apparently his gonococcal infection in Thailand. And uh, apparently that isolate is showing resistance to ceftriaxone and azithromycin. So you can see this is a frightening trend, um, and we're very worried about um, the development of drug resistance in gonorrhea. So there are alternative treatments, uh, right? And, uh, and uh, so there are other regimens you can give, although the first line regimen really recommended is ceftriaxone IM plus azithromycin. Um, but the point I want you to remember from this slide, um, again, we're focused on extragenital infections here, is that if you treat a gonococcal infection at, uh, at the pharyngeal site with any regimen other than ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, you're actually supposed to do a test of cure. And uh, remember, if you're doing a NAT test, uh, it's important to wait at least 14 days so you don't catch dead bugs. Uh, but for our culture as well, um, wait that 14 days. Um, for, if you're treating uh, gonorrhea at any other site with an alternative regimen, you don't need to do that. But remember, in the throat, uh, you do need to do this test of cure. And remember, with uh, both, both gonorrhea and with chlamydia, if a patient is diagnosed with it, you need to rescreen them at three months after treating. And that's not to check if the treatment worked. That's because there's a very high rate of reinfection. Okay. So with that, we'll move on to uh, treatment of extragenital chlamydia. And treatment of chlamydia at any site, the recommendations are to either give azithromycin uh, or doxycycline for seven days. And there are a few, uh, there are a few other uh, alternative regimens here. Um, now, I think there's been a lot of attention recently to the fact that um, there's uh, that potentially doxycycline might be a little bit better for urogenital um, uh, chlamydia than azithromycin. And I think the study that's gotten the most attention uh, was one that was published by Geisler et al. in the New England Journal. Um, in which they basically took uh, an incarcerated population of young women who are diagnosed with chlamydia and randomized them to either get the doxycycline for a week or the one-time azithromycin dose. And doxycycline was a little bit better. Um, there was about a 3.2% treatment failure group in the, uh, sorry, a 3.2% treatment failure in the azithromycin group, no treatment failures in the doxycycline group. Now, Amongst all of those patients, and there were many, that only still added up to very few infections. 
Um, and I think the criticism of this study is that uh, this is not as applicable to the real world, right? Because in this setting, they really had incarcerated patients. They actually could watch and make sure that those patients took every single dose of doxycycline. Uh, but in the real world, there are many advantages uh, to being able to have that patient take the entire azithromycin dose right in front of you as they're sitting there. Um, and uh, there are, I think, concerns about compliance with a medication you have to take twice a day for seven days. So I think most people feel uh, that for regular old urogenital chlamydia, uh, probably azithromycin or doxycycline are uh, both the good choices, but azithromycin may even be a little bit better because of that advantage that you can see the patient take the whole dose. Now, um, there's, I think, more question about rectal chlamydia. And so, uh, again, there are multiple studies that suggest that doxy is probably a bit better. Um, but there was a meta-analysis that actually found that there was about almost a 20% random effects pooled efficacy difference in favor of doxycycline, that doxycycline really was uh, better. Now, there's no randomized control trial as yet. I think uh, they're working on this. Uh, but uh, this is something important to remember. And that really brings us uh, to our last major topic here, which is LGV, or lymphogranuloma venerium. So this is a relatively rare infection, uh, but uh, we have seen some cases, and we have even seen some cases here in Baltimore, uh, Dr. Gatos tells me. So I, think, uh, so I think it's something you should be aware of. So uh, just to step back for a second, the D through K serovars of chlamydia trachomatis cause regular old urogenital chlamydia that I think you're used to thinking about. But the L1 through L3 serovars of chlamydia trachomatis cause LGV, or lymphogranuloma venerium. And these strains are much more invasive, and they cause a very different clinical syndrome than regular old chlamydia. Um, it's endemic in uh, some countries in the developing world, uh, but we've seen outbreaks in Europe and here in the US as well, mostly in men who have sex with men, uh, mostly in HIV positive men who have sex with men. So um, there was an MMWR uh, that came out in 2016 um, that reported on an outbreak in HIV positive MSM in Michigan, uh, for example. And so what uh, clinical syndrome does it cause? Well. Um, three to 21 days after exposure, you get a primary lesion, which is just a little ulcer. And interestingly, this ulcer is painless, kind of like the ulcer of syphilis, right? So many patients may not even notice it and may not know that they have it. Um, but then later on, uh, 10 days to even six months later, you can get secondary lesions, you can get some systemic symptoms, you can get tender inguinal uh, lymphadenopathy here. Um, uh, that you can see here, uh, those uh, lymph nodes can actually rupture and drain pus. They can be very, very painful. And then I think what you might see and you might pick up in your patient population, although it's still rare, is uh, that LGV can cause a very severe proctitis. Um, so gonorrhea and chlamydia usually at the rectum are asymptomatic. LGV is usually symptomatic, and it can be very severely so. So people can have severe pain. Uh, they can have diarrhea. They can have rectal bleeding. They can also have uh, constipation or tenismus. Um, and uh, this infection can actually extend, and you can actually get a proctocolitis, so infection that goes uh, further up. And uh, an important point to remember is that um, if you actually go and do a biopsy and look at this under the microscope, it can look identical to inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and the big problem with that is that the therapy that you're going to give for IBD or inflammatory bowel disease is sort of the opposite of what you would like to give uh, for LGV, right? It's immunosuppression, steroids, things like that. And we've actually had a couple of cases in which people were not thinking about LGV. They didn't sort of ask a thorough sexual history. Um, they had a colonoscopy, di got diagnosed with IBD, and then got therapy for that, but got very, very sick. Uh, we had a patient who was actually in the ICU with gram-negative translocations. So something important uh, to remember. So LGV, again, um, what you'll probably see if you ever see it is uh, a very uh, symptomatic proctitis in men who have sex with men. Um, so diagnosis, uh, really, again, important uh, to look at clinical findings. Um, of course, take a very thorough sexual history. Um, serologic tests, so antibody tests, can uh, support the diagnosis. Um, but I think what's probably easily accessible to most of you, remember the, the NAT test for chlamydia um, will be positive, uh, but you need special testing to identify whether that's regular old chlamydia or an LGV strain. Um, and so you know where you can get that testing done probably varies by where you are. Um, um, here at our academic center, um, we're able to do uh, some special testing, but really sending it to the CDC is usually the option.
Um, treatment is a little bit longer than for regular chlamydia. It's doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID for 21 days, so not just the seven days. There are a couple of treatment alternatives here. But I think the take home point is to remember that in symptomatic MSM, who are symptomatic with proctitis, um, you really need to be suspecting this. And if they have a positive rectal chlamydia, or if they're HIV positive, um, really you should be treating them empirically for LGV. And I think think about, if at all possible, trying to send that test uh, for, um, for LGV to the CDC. So um, our last sort of slide here is really uh, proctitis and proctocolitis. So I said uh, most of the time these infections at the rectal site are asymptomatic, but they can be symptomatic. Um, and uh, proctitis, uh, again, you can get anal rectal pain, tenismus, rectal discharge. For proctocolitis, um, you can have uh, diarrhea as well. And the, the organisms that cause this, uh, so proctitis can be caused by gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, uh, certainly LGV, as we just discussed. Syphilis can cause a proctitis and herpes can cause a very symptomatic painful proctitis. Um, LGV can cause a proctocolitis and then remember there's some other organisms that can cause uh, a more uh, significant infection. And so initial testing, certainly you should be testing for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia with a NAT test. Um, syphilis serologies are probably a good idea. Um, HSV, particularly if you see actual ulcers, um, should be done. And the empiric treatment, uh, while you're waiting for all these tests to come back, is ceftriaxone plus doxycycline for seven days. And if there are pa painful ulcers present, you really want to consider treating for HSV or herpes as well. And remember, though, the point that I made before, that symptomatic MSM, uh, particularly those who have either a positive rectal NAT or HIV positive, should really have uh, presumptive treatment for LGV. Um, with doxycycline uh, in addition to the ceftriaxone for 21 days. So take-homes here, um, just to summarize, extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia may be transmitted to others. Um, rectal infection is linked to an increased risk of HIV acquisition. Um, the throat may be a very important site for the development of drug-resistant gonorrhea. Um, and the majority of extragenital gonococcal and chlamydial infections are asymptomatic. So seek and you shall find. Um, so if you ask about sites of exposure and test accordingly, you're going to detect asymptomatic disease. Uh, the majority of extragenital infections in men who have sex with men will be missed with urogenital only screening. And in those at risk, you really want to be asking and screening uh, every three to six months. Um, there are no explicit screening rec recommendations for women and men who have sex with women, but at least in high prevalence settings, I think there's a suggestion that a significant proportion of infections may be missed with urogenital only screening. And uh, so just keep in, t uh, keep in mind, don't ask, won't tell, don't test, won't find. So you've got to be asking your patients in a non-judgmental, you know, open-minded way about uh, their sexual behaviors and then testing accordingly. Um, and finally, LGV is a rare but important cause of symptomatic proctitis uh, and even proctocolitis, uh, particularly in MSM and those who are HIV positive, um, and requires a longer treatment course of doxycycline. So symptomatic MSM with proctitis uh, should uh, have consideration for treatment for LGV. So uh, remember that uh, by law, healthcare providers in Maryland have to report gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, hepatitis B and C, and HIV. And uh, remember that your state and local health departments are your allies in STI prevention. Please contact them with questions about diagnosis and treatment. And if they contact you about uh, a, a possible case, uh, please try to cooperate and help them because they're really trying uh, to cut down on the spread of these infections. Um, lastly, we have a bunch of resources uh, that I think are really nice uh, that can be helpful in giving you information about treatment. That the STD treatment guidelines, uh, there's our national STD curriculum as well as this clinical toolbox app. And then we do have an STD warm line where you can actually enter in uh, patient questions and you'll get answers within a very short period of time. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, if anyone online has a question, please email to the um, email address that you'll see on the screen. Are there any questions in the auditorium? Thank you so much, Dr. Tindam. Um, if resources were unlimited, and given the fact that we know some patients, both male and female, don't disclose oral and rectal sex, would you ever recommend sort of universal three-site testing? 
Yes, I think if resources were unlimited, that would be great <laughs> because I can guarantee you that we would find some infections. Resources are not unlimited, so I think um, each uh, clinic has to make those decisions about what their policy would be. But yes, absolutely, I think um, if resources were unlimited, uh, the more testing you do at those sites, the more likely you are to find uh, these infections. Now, I think there's been some research on potentially doing pooled specimens to try to um, cut down on the cost, uh, where you actually pool multiple specimens and then only go after testing individual uh, patient specimens if you get a positive. Um, and so things, you know, people I think are doing uh, things like that uh, to try to deal with the cost issue. Um, uh, but yes, I think if you had unlimited resources, more testing would be great. Any questions from the audience? Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. All right, thank you very much.